Hello everybody, James here, Franchise University with Shane Douglas himself and normally we don't do plugs on this, we just launch straight into the podcast which is almost becoming our trademark on uh, these shows, <laughs> but I've got one thing to say, Shane Douglas questions at gmail.com. That is the email you need to use if you want to email, uh, very uh, uh, specifically, uh, questions into Shane Douglas for a future episode for fan questions. You can also go to Shane Douglas' official YouTube channel and navigate your way to the community page. There you will find a post saying Shane Douglas wants your questions. And from there, just reply to that post with your question. I'll make sure it gets added to the list. And of the... Ooh... 80, 90, something like that, questions we got in for that last post we did. I've pared it down to about 15 or so questions from fans of this very show. Of uh, previous ones that we did of the Ask Shane Anything deals, I was using questions from like eight, nine months ago. These ones are fresh from the fans. Uh, Ask anything that's (laughs) non-mathematics. Wasn't my best subject in school, but anything wrestling related, I'll be good at. Good stuff there. I'm I'm glad to hear that. There's there's very little in mathematics here, but plenty in wrestling. And here's the first one. Sam Carter has asked you, were there any, uh, excuse me, were there ever any talks between Shane and WWE after WCW was purchased? If not, was Shane ever even interested in going back to WWE in 2001? Shane would have been an incredible character during the invasion angle instead of the mid-tier jobbers we ended up getting. Well, there were simultaneous things going on at that time. Great question, Sam. Uh, First of all, we were still being paid by WCW because our contracts ran through, uh, I think, 2003 or something like that. And you had a Turner contract, didn't you? You weren't a WCW contract. You were on Turner. Yeah, Correct. And so I would have to give that up, which was a pretty good chunk of money. But I had said whenever I left there in 95 – and and we talked about this previously off camera, James, about being people of principle. Uh, you know, you 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 can say you're a person of principle, and then when the wind blows the way, you go, well, it's okay. I'm just doing it this one time, and you're 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 nothing more than paid for hire. Um, uh, and and I've tried wrongly or rightly to live my life by principle, and I've failed at times. And but it's not because for you know I've just ignored it or just said to hell with it. Um, so I said whenever I left there in '95, uh, he'll never get me again. You know, got me once on the pay stuff. You know, we've talked about that previously. Uh, he won't get me twice. And there's been multiple times that I was contacted, most notably when they relaunched ECW. Uh, Tommy Dreamer called me and said they had just walked out of the meeting and Vince wanted me to be the first uh, to be signed up. And Tommy and I talked four days in a row on the phone, the last time for about eight hours. I was living in Florida at the time, and I had actually left my house, talked on the phone, went down to uh, the T- uh, TGI Fridays or Applebee's or something, whatever it was there, and uh, sat there and ate and drank and talked to Tommy the whole time, and I kept telling him over and over again, please tell Vince, I said, thank you for thinking of me, uh, and uh, but I, I'm going to pass this on interested. And uh, you know, because if I'd go back and get it again, then I'd have nobody to blame but myself. And uh, quite honestly, the fans have listened to me long enough to know that I just have a fundamental difference in the approach to the business than, than Vince McMahon does. It's his ballywick. He can do what he, what he wants with it. But for me to again go in there and say, okay, well, I'm going to abandon my principles and I'm going to go ahead and put myself, prone myself again to possibly getting screwed on money again. Uh, then I got nobody to blame but myself. Been there, done that. And in, in my uh, career, I'd never wanted to repeat I, you know, so you'll see this, like there's a, at certain points of my career, you can see a de- Shane Douglas developing it growing a, a, as a character. Uh, and I wanted to, I had always said, I wanted to learn all the aspects of, of my business before I left. I wanted to know why the director shot from that camera instead of this camera. Why, why did the promoter or the booker put this person over instead of that person? Why did they do this spot in that location? Uh, that's the stuff that interested me and kept me from being bored just watching wrestling matches every night, although I could watch great wrestling matches every night. Uh, so for me, it was a, it was more based on principle. And there were three other times, four times altogether, that the WWF had called me, WWE had called me, uh, and I just really had no auspice to go up. And when I say that my six months there in 95 was the worst of my career, uh, I mean that. I mean, it was... Uh, I'd always loved wrestling. I never felt like I'd gone to work a day in my life, except those six months. That was a trudge of a job. Uh, you know, it's, it might sound silly to to the fans out there. Shane Douglas and Troy Martin are two different people. Thank God. 
Um, and I, I'm comfortable being Troy Martin. But I like playing Shane Douglas for that 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 minutes a night that I get to play him. But to stay in that character, which is what I would have to do to keep from going off uh, at certain people, was mentally draining. I would come home off the road from them and felt like I had just been put through the ringer three times because I had to maintain that character, that wall as the franchise, so I wouldn't grab somebody by their throat. And it was exhausting. And I, I don't want to experience that again. Uh, you know, th- th- there's no ill will towards Vince or anybody that's long since gone. Uh, me and most of the clique have put the heat well behind us. Uh, you know, and, I, and I'm trying to teach my boys some things now about that type of thing. Like, you know, just better way to live your life. Uh, but I, I couldn't prone myself to Vince again because I've been there, done that. Don't don't agree with his philosophy on the business. Uh, certain I wouldn't like what he would be doing with my character. So I'd have nobody to blame. And again, based on principle, like we'd said earlier, uh, off camera, James, like if somebody came and said, okay, but you, you know, would you murder somebody for a million bucks? Mm-hmm. No. Uh, would you rob a bank for a hundred thousand? No, no, it's because then I'm, I'm nothing more than a prostitute at that point. If you're going to pay me the highest dollar, I'll just go do what you want me to do. And, uh, and I'm quite comfortable with this. I've reached the stage of my life where I know who I am? Uh, and I'm comfortable with that. I'm well aware of the warts and, uh, warts and all, and, and how badly my farts stink. Um, and, and I'm fine with that. Uh, because ultimately, I believe that when you put your head on a pillow at night, like you got to be comfortable with with who who that person is, and you get up every morning, you look yourself in the mirror before you shave, and who do you? I, I ask my boys this: You get to decide who's staring back at you. Do you respect that guy? Do you think that guy's a schmuck? And I'm comfortable with my skin with where I am right now. So uh, no ill will towards them. I wish them the best of luck in anything they do. Uh, but I had never had a desire to go back and won't go back. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to bring up. Um... In 1999, and we've told this story on this podcast, I believe, if not the other channel, uh, both of these, uh, you, I don't know if WWF made an overture to you or the other way around, but I think they offered you what you called an insultingly low offer, like 135 or something like that, compared to WCW, yeah. so you went WCW. It was also the time that we have told on the other channel, WSI, where there was a chance you would have gone to the WWF in early 2000 with Benoit, Malenko, Saturn, uh, Guerrero. Um so uh, in the early 2000 thing, was there no chance of you ever thinking of going to the WWF or would you have actually considered going in 2000? Yeah, was considering it, but was considering it only as the block. I knew that Vince, I was smart enough to understand that Vince definitely wanted Benoit. He definitely wanted Guerrero. He had real no interest in, in Dean. He had real no interest in Perry. He had no real interest for sure in me, uh, but he would have taken as the block. And as we've seen, you know, with the click or you know those certain groups that would stick together, you'd have some some leverage to it. Uh, uh, but I, I knew that that was not going to be, ever be the real deal. So I think my agreeing to it was just a counterbalance against WCW. Uh, I didn't know I was taking at face value what Dean and Chris and Perry were telling me, uh, which later turned out not to be the case. But ultimately, there's a reason why I didn't sign my release from WCW, even though I was threatened and withheld pay for, you know, they, they had violated the contract for quite a while. Um, uh, there was a, a reason why ultimately I didn't was because I didn't want it to go. I, when I had signed my contract with WCW, that was in complete good faith. I, th- I, I knew that them, Eric wanted to bring me and Ric Flair to, to television, that that could have really catapulted could have been the engine that drove WCW back up uh, because the fans were well aware of the heat between us and uh, uh, that it was legit. And that I think would have tuned up, it would have given a new dimension of realism to wrestling that was badly needed at that time. Uh, so like the, to me, I think it was always more exploratory stage and to work off as a counterbalance to WCW. I never really envisioned myself going back to WWF only because I couldn't see myself back in that system. I knew that I couldn't thrive in that system. Uh, you know, when I went there in 95 and I was told to speak in a monotone voice and never raise my voice or lower my voice and do to that, uh, there's zero money in that. That's a, for me, that's a channel flip. And, uh, you know, and the reasoning that I was told. So, you know, I, I knew that Vince, when he, especially with the, the re 
figured ECW there, ECW had two. Um, I knew because when I was there in 95 that Vince had zero respect for ECW. Vince McMahon had never said those three letters to me. It was always the bingo hall company, the small pond, the minor league, the blood and guts company, euphemisms like that. But he mm -hmm. never one time said to me, hey, in ECW, that franchise carrot, that was pretty good stuff. Uh, you know, so I knew in my bones that he was not doing this for any altruistic reason and certainly wasn't doing it to to shine a spotlight on ECW. I think in in my estimation, it was at the time, if you remember, the, the fans would go crazy when they saw something that looked halfway legitimate in the ring. What would they chant? ECW, ECW, right? And so you could tell and you'd watch it at home. You'd hear you see the fans pumping their fists three times and you'd hear. <sighs> <laughs> and and it, it, the the visual didn't go with what you were hearing. I think Vince did that intentionally to put out such a bad version of ECW. Him thinking that the fans will stop chanting ECW because it's going to be so bad of a version. And instead, what it did was it grew the legend of the real ECW. So, uh, no, it's I, I don't believe that it was legit. Uh, at least on my part, it was more counterbalance to get WCW off my back. Next question. Chris Bradshaw has said, Shane, you have mentioned that when you were to be a heel in ECW, you didn't know all of the details involved versus being a babyface. Along those lines, could you describe your philosophy on what it takes to be a world champion and how you approached the role, as I believe specifically as a heel? Uh, what was that guy's name again? Chris. Chris Bradshaw. Chris. Chris, a great, great question. Uh, uh, like I said a second ago, I'd always wanted to learn every aspect of my sport before I got out of it. And uh, baby face, uh, you know, heels didn't look like blonde hair, blue eyed guys, uh, you know, with 32 inch waists. So, or I'm lying 34 inch waist. Um, who's, who's counting? Uh, so for me going in naively, I thought that being a heel was just opposite of being a baby face. And if it were only that easy, uh, it's much deeper than that. There's <laughs> layers and layers deeper than that. If you want to be a successful heel, I mean, you, like we, we joke about it all the time, but you could be the, the dastardly, snidely, whiplash, he, he, he bad guy, which I think is sort of cornball. Uh, you know, I, I think the most dangerous heel is the heel that can look you in the eye and say, well, I, I killed your mother because, and fill in that blank and you go, well, I still hate the son of a bitch, but I get his point. That's a dangerous heel, right? <laughs> Somebody could convince you of the evil was proper to do. Uh, and, and that was my approach to it once I understood what really being a heel was. And that was learned completely by Terry Funk. Uh, it, it was my blessing. And I've talked about this before in my career, having met Dominic and then Bruno and then, you know, working under Bill Watts and then Dusty and Magnum and all these great uh, Black Bart and all these guys that you know, were, were instrumental in my career. Uh, who better to have taught this young punk baby face how to be a heel than Terry Funk. And, uh, you know, I, I gravitated towards that. It's, it, and if you go back and look like the, the, the character that we've become, that we've come to know as the franchise, uh, he took on certain parameters, but early on, you can see a very two dimensional heel, uh, as I'm sort of pushing the boundaries on this guy and trying to figure him out. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the crassness was, was meant to be uh, a turnoff, uh, you know, so that it's, uh, you know, the, the, I, I had a teacher in 10th grade, my literature teacher, they used to have a th embroidered thing above her blackboard that said, uh, profanity is the sign of a mental cripple. And that was really my approach to the cussing with the franchise. It's supposed to show you this guy. Yeah. He can use a lot of big words and stuff, but he's just a jerk. Like he's just, he's, he's, condescending to the lowest common denominator instead of raising it up to the highest denominator. And, uh, you know, now today when I hear everybody use the F-bomb 10 times in a sense, I'm like, no, not, not what the intention was. Uh, but that character was fun for me because it was different. It was new. It was, you know, bank, blank slate. It's like an artist going up to a big slab of marble and going, okay, what can I carve out of this thing? Uh, it could be this, it could be that, it could be anything I want it to be, but you got to see it in the, in the stone. And the same thing for the franchise character was, okay, this is going to be a block by block building. And so I think like a year, year and a half into the franchise, you start to see that character really take on tones that were quite nefarious and, uh, uh, off-putting, you know, you know, like I said, I, he would trip the old lady. 
Uh, and if he helped the old lady cross the street, he would do it so he could trip her on the other side and take her purse. There's there was no him would help the old lady because I'm a nice guy. Um, and, and that really was the approach to the character to be non redeeming. And uh, you know, in that, I think there would have been a play at the end uh, for him to have a hell of a baby face run because he had been that stone cold heel, as Bill Watts would have put it, uh, and and Eddie Gilbert, uh, that he had been so nasty so so non-redeeming that now he's coming back to the light you know I, I like he's he's trying to find his way back to his earlier roots i think it would have been a hell of a story to tell that ecw missed out on uh but for me having been put with terry funk the the entire approach uh to the character to answer his question was to find this guy that was completely non-redeeming but not the the pussy heel uh the franchise is tough he's just not as tough as he thinks he is He's a great wrestler. He's just not as great as he thinks he is. He's smart. He's not as smart as he thinks he is. It's just, instead of the proverbial slip on the banana peel and get the pie in the face, soupy sales type stuff, vaudeville stuff, this was to be the guy that in the 1990s where wrestling, where the where the culture was going, this guy fit in the culture like a glove. But if you peel back a veneer of that, you look and see this guy's a scumbag. Okay, he looks looks appealing on TV and he's good at what he does, but just a little peek behind the curtain, and you go, ooh, man, like that guy, whoo, he's a jerk off. And uh, and that's what it was supposed to be. A little more nuanced. Uh, I, you know, there's times I look back and I, like I told you before off camera, uh, uh, James. There, there's times I go back and watch my stuff and I go, oh, why did I do that? You know, or you just see the worst of what you do. But whenever I do go back and I watch those iconic moments of the franchise, the throwing down of the belt, uh, the the Halo incident, uh, you know, the stuff with Francine, I, there's never a time, and I know what we're doing. We're we're she and I are acting. And but when you watch it, there's a real belief that this is a couple that these guys are involved, and you know. So I think we we were good at what we do. And I think uh, a few weeks ago, I just heard this news story: uh, uh, the superintendent that would hire me uh, back in the nineties. Uh, when I went to her office, she had told me about how excited they were to have me, and I'm you know, so thrilled and all the worldly experience that I had and the knowledge of my field. I later found out that that same lady had gone to a school board meeting and showed footage of me as the franchise to show why this this is the last guy in the world you can hire as a as a teacher. And this woman has a PhD after her name, so now you can see why I call them Fuds, Elmer Fuds. Uh, so, like, based on that, I, you know, James, you like acting? You ever seen Anthony Hopkins in a movie you like? Mm -hmm. Don't go have dinner at his house because I've seen him eating people in the movies. That's really how ridiculous this is. <laughs> and so it just underscores with italicized and emboldened letters why I call PhDs what I do. And I'm sure there's some out there that are taking offense at this right now. But my experience with them is book smart, world dumb. And that it, therein lies the proof. If anybody out there watching thinks that that guy, the franchise, is who Troy Martin is, uh, you're probably going to be pretty disappointed when you meet me because I'm nothing like that guy. Thank God. <laughs> Next question. And this is probably my favorite one of everyone. GA313 has asked, were Shane's boots inspired by the Ultimate Warrior or Texas Tornado? Was that a homage to one or both of these guys, or was it just your personal preference? Thanks. A great question. Uh, G, what is it, 313? Three? <clears throat> the, the, problem, the problem is a lot of these are usernames, so not everyone's put yeah. their name on the thing. So GA313. Yeah, yeah, yeah. GA313, okay. So great question. Uh, it, it was homage of a sort, but here's a little secret we won't let the rest of the world in on. I have tiny calves. <laughs> um, and no matter how hard I worked my legs and I, if, if for the people out there that work out, leg workouts suck. It's not, it's not like you get like your upper body, you get that good pump and everything. I worked my legs out for six months straight in college, like a dog. And I gained nothing, not a quarter, eighth, tenth of an inch, nothing. And so I thought, well, okay, this is just a bad, you know, I inherited these legs from my mother. And so this is what I got. And I looked at Carrie and realized Carrie's wear, you know, wearing the fringe to, to conceal the, the the foot prosthetic. And I'm watching, you can't even tell. And it was a bit different. You know, by then Carrie was gone, I believe. And then uh, well, no, it'd be sometime after that, but you know, that that's where I'd pick it up. And then the ultimate word that 
more happenstance than, than anything, but the, the practical reason was I had small calves and that would help cover up the calves a little bit. And it was a little bit of a different look. There wasn't a lot of people that had that in wrestling. So uh, it, it was adopted purely for cosmetic reasons. Hmm. Uh, that's why a, a similar reason Ric Flair always wore his knee pads around his calves was yeah. because skinny calves and there you go. So uh, yes. yeah, uh, yeah. A, a, a great question there. And we're, a great we're vain people. We're very vain. It's <laughs> hey, did you, it's not just an upper body business, as Rick Flair, right. may, uh, Rick Flair, Rick Rude may have suggested. I think it's lower well, body as well. As, as Mike Hegstrom, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the 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 late and great uh, hawk of the road warriors, say, "Yeah, well, I ain't never beat nobody up and had him get up and say he had small calves." <laughs> <laughs> well, he is a hawk, can put it right. Beautiful. <laughs> Next one, Doc Hendricks, not the original, hopefully, but uh, or maybe it is. Who knows? Thoughts on Charlotte Flair. Uh, I, I give Charlotte a lot of credit because, again, like we had said earlier in a previous uh, episode about uh, uh, about his son coming into wrestling, uh, you know that's a those are big shoes to fill. And uh, Charlotte, I, I think, has come in and done as admirable a job as you as you can. Certainly, and it makes perfect sense. It looks like she's mimicking Ric Flair, right, and, and her work. Um, uh, she she's taken it to a different place. She's imbuing what we all know is a male character, the nature boy, Ric Flair. Uh, but as his kid can do it and it looks, anybody else does it, it's going to look like you're ripping this guy off. For her to do it, though, it's it's, it's really brilliant because I, this is what you would expect. I'm sure if, if one of my boys or both of my boys go into the business, you'd either be comparing against the franchise. He's either better, worse, looks like, doesn't look like, acts like, doesn't act like the franchise. Uh, but because she's a woman, I think she's allowed to give that leeway. Uh, when his son came in and did it, I think it was like, okay, we're going to compare apples to apples. And it's a bit of an unfair comparison. But because she's a woman, I think she can get away with it in the sense that it doesn't look like a direct ripoff, different sex. Uh, and women's wrestling was in need of somebody that could get in there and do that and instead of what we would see typically in diva wrestling right it would be the you know the a move here a move there but you know m you know more of the the woman type stuff and i think when you're watching charlotte you especially for those of us that are well versed in rick you'll look at it oh <laughs> nature boy you know you see it it's it's it, it it comes off as a direct homage and it makes perfect sense and fits like a glove because it's his daughter so it's it, good stuff Next question, Jeff Cole. What was the best part of interviewing Monty Brown? Oh, Monty had so much energy. Uh, you know, it, 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 he just, and he's, it's not just wrestling character. That's him as a person. Like when you're around him, you just feel upbeat. Uh, uh, you see, you put a, a smile, goes, it's the same thing with Ron Simmons, right? You see, Ron, boom, big smile goes on your face. It's automatic. Uh, people see me like, Ooh, not him. but uh, Monty would bring so much energy, you know, doing, doing those back when you're sitting there doing interview after interview after interview backstage, and you get, I'm gonna give 100%, I'm like, rah, 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 rah. and it becomes like almost cliche. But with Monty, you, you, you always know he's gonna build to a crescendo at some point, and it was fascinating to listen to him because he would come from a little bit different direction each time, but you knew where it was going to go. And so like, you, you're just waiting for it, waiting for it. Boom. Here it go. Okay. Here it comes the line. Right. Uh, he was fun. And, and, and his personality is so ebullient that it, it, it boys you when you're bored. Cause you've done 20 of these already. And then here comes my, okay, good, good. This one's going to be fun. Uh, yeah, he was always he, just a good dude. Uh, you know, and I, 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 he's one of those guys that I always wonder, like, wh whatever happened to him? Like, he, I, I haven't seen him in years. And like, when you do see him, it's going to be years again before you do see him. Uh, it, it, you know, it, just when I think of Monty, like, much like Ron and, uh, and, and Steamer and other, yeah, uh, Jim Duggan, as soon as you think of those names, boom, the smile goes on your face because you just have great, great memories of being around them. And Monty was very much that for me. And, and at the time he was, you know, brand new coming into the business. So, uh, you know, he, he always, plus we, we stand there waiting to, you know, the camera wasn't ready, uh, you know, waiting for something to get set over from the office, uh, and we would just sit there and talk. He struck me as somebody that was very, very eager to learn the business. 
he was trying. And that re- gets respect for me because it already like <clears throat> said a million times, our business ain't easy to learn. And, you know, being a former pro football player, okay, that's great. It's a big plus, but there's been a lot of football players that haven't quite transitioned. Uh, you know, so for him to, to, to see him coming in and take, and he didn't come in like, I'm a big star, I'm a former NFL player, and like, I'm going to show you guys a thing or two. He came in completely disarming, understanding this is a new genre, a new venue, and lots to learn. Uh, but just his personality is is just one that just you know, puts a smile on your face as soon as you hear his name. I remember Monty Brown very well, because I was watching TNA a lot. We had the wrestling channel. We got TNA in all the time. <clears throat> and... Man, he was just one of the few proper TNA homegrown talents. I mean, yes, you can say AJ Styles started in WCW, but he didn't. Yes, he did. But yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, like Samoa Joe, you'd say Ring of Honor as well, but you know, Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, Christopher Daniels, a couple of others, amazing red back in the day. Monty yeah. Brown, he was one of those proper TNA homegrown talents. I just thought the, the sky, you know, the sky was the limit for him. And yeah. where did he disappear? Was it a family thing that he just left the business? Yeah, I, I, I'm clueless because it's, you know, again, like we, you, as many conventions and signings and appearances that we make, you usually run into, it might be a year or two, but you usually run into the same faces over and over again. And his is one that I haven't seen in quite a while. Uh, I did see him somewhere. I'm, I'm thinking like in the last four or five years, but that was it. Like since TNA, that was the, the only time I'd seen him. And so if any of the fans out there, again, you know, not you have the address, uh, uh, what is it? Shane Douglas questions dot com. Uh, yes, or almost. Uh, Shane Douglas questions at gmail dot com. So if you want to contact Gmail, the show Gmail. for anything other than sending in a question, you can do it that way as well. Please, yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to hear. And if any any of the guys out there know, next time I see you, please let me know because uh, I'd love to run into Monty again. Yeah, good guy. Uh, right, let's move on. Uh, Scott Risley or Risley? I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. I'll say Risley. Thoughts on OVW Al Snow? And the Netflix wrestler show. Have you seen it? I, I haven't seen it. Uh, full disclosure, I have not seen it. I've heard descriptions of it. Uh, kudos to Al and OVW and getting something on the air that's any, I've always said any exposures. And I'm trying to teach it to my son right now in, in music with Dando Veins. And, uh, you know, any exposure is good exposure. Even somebody saying that they stunk the stage up last night, somebody's reading the name Dando Veins. So there's, you know, there's, there's always a silver lining to things. Um, he, I, I, I was a bit surprised again, going off of what I was told, I was a bit surprised because I thought, Al, uh, super smart guy. Uh, but I thought he had been more protective of the business. You know, I don't know if, you know, again, what I've been told is accurate, but like, I, I think there's the, the, the thing we don't need, the lowest hanging fruit in our business is to somebody come in and say, Hey, wrestling's a work. Fill in the rest of the blank. Oh, okay. Tell me something. I don't know. You know, it's, how about we set the bar a little bit higher? Um, and again, I full disclosure, I haven't seen one visually seen one second of it. I've heard descriptions of it. Uh, I would hope that as the show runs, that there, there would be more of an art towards, okay, now that we've shown you this, let's show you what, you know, how we cut the lady in half and why we do it and why we do it the way that we do it. Uh, to bring some more legitimacy back to it. I, you know, I don't think there's anybody out there going, what? Like they talk about the stuff in the back. Uh, there's there's nothing earth shattering there. There's nothing new, uh, you know. And, and there's nothing that I, I'm not saying that they should go out and say, "Well, now wrestling's real and OVW is real." So now you got to believe because we're real now. Uh, how about you don't say either? How about you don't show either? How about you show? I think it's fine to to, to watch a young talent talking to Al or somebody there saying, "Okay, well." Like how I was trying to flesh the franchise character out. Like what, give me some parameters to this guy. Would he do this or would he do that? Uh, th- that's fine. Uh, the approach to the matches, the philosophy of the stuff, that's fine. What the heat spot's going to be, that's fine. Hell, even if you want to go over the finish, I personally wouldn't do that, but that's fine. The fans already know this. The, the point is, I think it needs to have more texture as to more than just this is why it's tough to be a wrestler. There's all this stuff to learn. Okay. But once you get past that, then what's the story? Uh, that That's a base. That's a base you're going to build on. But what's the story beyond that? And so, again, with full disclosure, having not seen it, I'm just going off the things that I've been told about it. 
And I don't think that professional wrestling or sports entertainment right now needs any more exposés. We've been exposé to death. Uh, what is it about the match that uh, that catches the the imagination and the fans go ballistic on? Uh, why did that one work and the one before and after didn't? I think that would be you know a bit more interesting to the fans to hear. Um, because it, it, there's so many approaches to this business. You know, when I do seminars and we do, you know, start easy things like locking up and into headlocks and in and out of spots. And I'll watch it and I'll see like 10 different ways. And I'll ask them like, well, so-and-so taught me this. And so, and there's always a name attached to it. This wrestler taught me how to do this. And this, I learned this from this wrestler. Okay. So there's, I, I can't say to everybody do it exactly how I do it. Cause that's the only way to do it. And that's the right way to do it. That's what works for me. Uh, but there are things, there are basic things in those moves. Uh, like on lockup, for instance, when you it's collar and elbow, the collar is supposed to be here. The collar isn't my hand way up here or way over here or drope down like this or touching the shoulder. It's to be a grab. If you've ever seen amateur wrestlers, they cup the neck, right? It's, it's a great, it's a grab to attempt to control you. Uh, and so I would find that more interesting to to the wrestling fan than just okay. Well, come behind the curtain with me, and I'll show you how we create the Oz. Um, it's uh, low hanging fruit, and and if I've misspoken on that, if that's not what it is, you know, I apologize. Uh, based on the things that I've been told from several different people, uh, I I personally wouldn't approach from that point of view. I would recommend you watch it because it's not. The training of wrestlers, it's sort of, uh, it's almost like a, an established promotion on the lower rungs, but it's more, very much more human interest. But the thing that mm. the best thing is, is the administrative side. Al Snow, the, he's like Krusty the Clown in the sense, you know, when he's <laughs> just like, when he's just dejected constantly, he's going, ugh, and just yeah. something else goes wrong. And yes. a wrestler's been popped for, something that he shouldn't be doing in a car and then he's got a financier above him who wants their own sort of vision incorporated and mm. then the monitors go out at a crucial time during a show it's it's actually it's actually the management of a wrestling company more than anything Good, else yeah. as well as the uh human interest stories that go along with it i'd do you know what honestly i'd highly recommend it i think you'd really enjoy it because i went in with the same thing that you were going Mm, it's going to be scratching the surface. It's going to be, you know, really sort of lame expose, like there's anything to expose anymore in that sense. Yes. But no, yep. it's, it really goes above and beyond your expectations. And it focuses on just a few of the wrestlers, like a young girl called Haley J, and then there's an mm -hmm. older fella called whatever he's called, Cashflow, even though that name makes no sense for his character. Mm. You know, just these just these little things where you you realize why they're in the business in the first place, why they stick yeah. at it, even though this guy's fifty and he's never been featured anywhere. Right. You know, it's it's stuff like that 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 is really interesting, and um, just their sort of struggles along. I I thoroughly recommend you to watch it and everybody else else to watch it because it will exceed your expectations in that sense. I think. Yeah, and like I said, if, if clearly it sounds as as though the 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 few things that I've been told. Uh, not completely accurate. See, that kind of stuff would be interesting to me because that's the, when, you know, I always make fun of Moose because when he promotes shows, uh, he gets so worked up. Mm. And he's probably done 150, 200 shows and he's like a piano wire and he's uh, ready to burst. I'm like, dude, like you're, what are you st so stressed for? Uh, you know, I get, I said, well, you know, you're going to have a heart attack or something over this. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, the show's going to end up coming off. The fans are going to get a good show. It's fine to be diligent in all those things, but yeah, there, there are a million and one things. When you watch, when you sit down and you watch a paper, you say a WrestleMania, and you look on it, understand like how many people are working on making that show and getting that show out, and then how, during that course of that night, how many things are going wrong, and as soon as they pop up, there's somebody addressing it to knock it back down and try to keep the facade of of, of it being. You know, a well-run show. Uh, a lot of times, they're, they're uneventful shows. But more times than not, there are things that pop up. You know, like We jokingly called earlier, like, the ghosts in the machine, right? Mm -hmm. The things that you don't see. Suddenly, the sound goes off. Well, okay, there's 10 miles, 10,000 miles of cable in this building. Where did it go out? 
uh, you know, and somebody's got to figure it out and fix it. You can't just say, okay, hold on. We're going to put WrestleMania on hold. So yeah, I, I would be interested in seeing that. And, uh, uh, I'll make it a point to, so I'll give a better answer the next time. Next question. Carl Hodkin. Hi, Shane. What's your favorite type of music? And do you have any favorite albums? Oh my god! Yeah, I mean, I, music yeah, keep, was. Keep, I was going to say keep this keep this to less than four hours answer because I know you're yeah, a big music yeah, fan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, music was for me like, a, 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 you know, when I was in that, like every human being goes through. When you're in your teens and you're trying to figure out who you are and dealing with acne and girlfriends and uh, school tests and all the other stuff, uh, music was a respite to me. That was a place that I could find refuge in. You know, put the the the, the album on. <laughs> date myself uh today uh you know stream it uh but you know music for me is very cathartic uh so like I, if i go to the gym and i have a certain kind of music i can get a great workout if i'm in a you know pissed off mood about something there's a certain kind of music that will, that will calm me down uh, but overriding my, my number one genre would be rock and roll right you know i'm a rock guy uh uh tinging towards heavy metal but heavy metal as I recall it, heavy metal, I would consider would be like Black Sabbath or uh, later uh, 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 Iron Maiden. Uh, I love those groups. Uh, to me, I, I, my son is a guitarist at a group called Dando Veins. Uh, just played their first song, uh, first gig in Pittsburgh. Uh, so I was the proud daddy on that. But like, I'm telling my son, like when you back in the 70s, when I was a kid, you know, 16, 17, 18, and listening to music, they, you had the, what they called the five supergroups. You had uh, Pink Floyd, you had Queen, you had Aerosmith, Led Zeppelin, and Kiss. There was never a time that you heard a song on the radio that would say Led Zeppelin went, is that Kiss or is that Queen? Led Zeppelin sounded like Led Zeppelin. Uh, Queen sounded like Queen. Kiss sounded like... You knew in the first two bars of that song who you were listening to. Today, you listen to it, and everybody sort of sounds a little bit alike, and it's just, is it this person? Oh, no, it's not that person. That's this uh, this group. Uh, back then, you knew instantly who was who, uh, and I think a lot of that started with Nirvana, uh, you know, incredible genre that completely wiped out the hair metal of the 80s, and uh, suddenly, though, within, what, six months, every single lead singer was blonde. Every lead singer was wearing a flannel shirt. And every group was singing about how much life sucks. And it just completely ruined Nirvana to me. It's just like bastardization of it. Uh, so rock and roll was my was my stuff. You listen back to the stuff from the late 60s, early 70s, even into the early 80s. Uh, you know, like I, those earlier Iron Maiden albums with Bruce Dickinson. And, you know, it's just, wow. What, you know, go back and listen to that music. And like I point out to my son, like, listen to Randy Rhodes on Ozzy's first uh a solo album. Randy's playing with the song and man, it's, it fits like a glove. Then it'll go into the chorus. Listen to Randy Rhodes in the background. He's just playing something else, but it fits the song. It's like a third, fourth, fifth layer to the song. It just expands it. It doesn't go like, wait, he's playing the wrong thing. It fits like a glove and somehow he's playing something different. Uh, that's the stuff to me. Michael Shanker, uh, uh, Rudolph Schenker from the from the Scorpions, Matthias Jobs, Jobs, uh, uh, Klaus Meine, the lead singer of the Scorpions. Uh, you know, everybody knows my affinity for Kiss. You don't get to be a, a group that's been out on the road for fifty years, selling out stadiums, and be a flash in the pan. Uh, the the cool thing for me as a kid was when Kiss was out. Rolling Stone despised them. Circus mm. Magazine despised them. The critics hated their guts, and so for me, that just made it all the cooler. Nobody likes them. That's why they're my group. Um, but you last for 50 years, you can talk about Gene Paul's pomposity, whatever they've earned their pomposity, right? They, they've done it. So, uh, you know, listen to that music and it's just, it, as a kid that took me through some really tough times in my life and uh, really throughout my life, you know, later going through divorce and you know, the ups and downs of this business, uh, music had, had always played a role, but my kids grew up listening to it. I listened to it 24 hours a day when I'm in the car. Uh, I uh, just, it helps helps calm that erratic brain down a little bit up there. I I, I love music and it's always going to play a part in my life. Uh, yeah, especially going up and down the roads, you know, as often as you have done and still do. Uh, go on, I'm gonna I'm gonna nail you down. Best album, favorite band, favorite song. Ooh, favorite band, Kiss. Um, favorite album. Ooh, I've never been asked that. Uh, Destroyer, obviously, I love. Uh, 
In Through the Outdoor by Led Zeppelin uh, was an amazing album. Uh, uh, Another Brick in the Wall by Pink Floyd. These are seminal albums. Uh, and, and even before that, even though the Beatles were pretty well before me, as I've gotten older, I've been turned on to their music and you listen to some of their stuff. And yeah, they hit the poppy stuff early on that, you know, ooze and all that, you know, the want to hold your hand and everything. Great pop songs. But then you look at where they go and, and you watch someone like Paul McCartney, who has for 60 years now in every genre put out songs that become hits. And to me, I always wonder about those one hit wonders. Okay, if you could come out and write a hit song, it would seem to me you ought to at least be able to do it twice, right? And then there's the history's rife with the one hit wonders. And then you look at someone like Paul McCartney, uh, uh, Richards and and and, and uh, Jagger, uh, Stanley and Simmons, and then you look and go, man, these guys have been doing this for five decades, six decades. The Stones just put out a new album, what, yesterday or the day before? I'm eager to hear. I just heard one of the songs with Lady Gaga. Man, like her pipes. She's like, oh, geez. Now, see, Lady Gaga is somebody I, I'm going to hear here and there, but I'm not going to go out and buy an album of hers. But now I'm being turned on. You listen to her, like she sounds like Aretha Franklin on that song. I mean, it's just like, wow, what a set of pipes. And so, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of those groups. But then, you know, there's, uh, you know, as I got older and, you know, li- listen to stuff, my my dad used to listen to the what we would call Muzak, right? It used to drive me crazy as a kid. But you listen to that stuff, come on now, like, and, uh, Tony Bennett, you know, you listen to this stuff, it's timeless. And you just listen to it, and boy, it just it, somehow it just calms the beast inside you. No matter how bad a day you're having, you listen to that music and go, oof, yeah, it's, that's good shit. Uh, so, yeah, music will always play a big part. So, like, the, the favorite albums, it's like my Mount Rushmore. I could give you probably 25 albums. Uh, but those are the ones that, like, really, you know, uh, you know, obviously in through the, uh, uh, sit into that, uh, uh, Dark Side of the Moon. I mean, that's such a seminal album, right? And how, how long is it was on the charts literally my entire teens. Uh, you know, you go back and listen to that stuff, and it never sounds you can anytime you turn it on, it's like whew, sounds as good as the first time I heard it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's timeless music. So it's uh you know, it's, it's always gonna be there. And uh, you know, my son, it's funny because my you know, he's now a professional guitarist, and uh, you know, he had gone through the period where you know, he'd grown up you know, the whole time. He's in the car seat behind my seat. He's listening to dad's music. And he reaches the point where something, you know, dad's music ain't cool to me anymore. I can't tell my friends I like my dad's music. But he's come full circle now. Called me up about six months ago. the dad, you ever hear this, this this first album by Black Sabbath? I'm like, yeah, a few times. <laughs> Once <laughs> or twice. And uh, he, you know, he's turned back onto it. I don't think he even realizes he's come full circle. Like he's mm-hmm. back there again. So dad's music's back the coming into vogue for my son. But uh, yeah, great, great stuff. Like you said, we can talk four hours on that. Yeah, no, no, uh, I'll say this very quickly. Uh, two, I equate two bits of music to units of time. The Wall, because I always listen to it in a loop when I'm flying, because it's about 90 minutes or so from yeah. front to back. So I know every single time the album's over, I've done another 90 minutes. And the other one is uh, me and the missus have decided that we're starting as a joke now we're listening to Meatloaf because every Meatloaf song always seems to be 10 minutes. So yeah. <laughs> so when we're driving somewhere and instead of saying how far is it or oh, about an hour away, we'll say six Meatloafs. So now Meatloaf, <laughs> yeah. so now Meatloaf is a unit of time for us now for, dis- for distance. Anyway, I shall yeah. move on. But yeah, I, I, well, I, I, well, one more footnote. If you're going to mention Meatloaf, you've got to mention Jim Steinem, right? Jim Steinem's the guy that wrote yeah, all those writer, amazing yeah. songs. Yeah, so great, great stuff. Have, yeah. you, have, you, have you seen him, Jim Steinem do solo stuff after he ditched Meatloaf? And it's yeah. weird. It just does, it does, yeah. it isn't yeah. right. He hasn't got the performance in him at all for it. And obviously he didn't have the voice. Yeah. Well, he wrote the song for uh, Celine Dion. Uh, uh, it's all coming back to me now. Uh, the video, she's in a house. There's a storm going on. It's a mansion. She's running down a hall and there's glass everywhere. Uh, he wrote that song. So like he's, you know, a lot of those guys that you you go back and you start researching, and you go like, man, I didn't realize he did all this. Uh, there's a a writer named Vinnie Poncia uh, that wrote some of Kiss's stuff and later stuff for Aerosmith. And I mean, you go down his, his, his credits and you're like, holy crap, he's written for everybody. Uh, but there's a lot of that in, in, in music. You know, you go back and look at the, I saw a documentary a couple of years ago. Uh, it was about the women that did the backing vocals on all those big albums in the, in the sixties. And you know, it's all the same people. 
And they were with this group, with that group, with Aretha Franklin, with uh, Tina Turner, and you know, all these different people. You go, man, these, these ladies, they, they were the pipes for the 60s. You know, it's uh, and in the seventies, yeah, just yeah, good stuff. I, I could talk music all day long. I love yeah, it. So like the vocal wrecking crew. Oh right, yeah, we, yeah, we, that, we, yeah. We, we we could we can carry on. We won't, we won't, we won't. Uh, <laughs> next question, Peter D. You have had Francine and Tori ringside for you, both stunning women. Do they take away from your persona in the ring as men are checking them out rather than watching you? Uh, no, I, th- look, there, there's times that we in the ring would grab rest hold and, and need to, you know, if you're going to go out and do a 45, 50 minute match uh, and you know, they were great. <laughs> you could obviously, I, I always joke around. Yeah. Somebody had to work with Tori and Franny. So I took one for the team. It was, uh, <laughs> they, they were both great to work with both incredibly professional, uh, both fast learners, both eager to perform, uh, both took on those roles, uh, you know, and, and you know, Franny and I have talked about it publicly. Uh, I, I feel sort of foolish now in 23 saying this, but in, in hindsight, I'm glad that we did because uh, uh, we're like best buddies now. We're like brother and sister. Uh, when we get around each other, we just, like two goofballs. Uh, and throw Sam in there, forget about it. You're going to laugh. You're going to pee your pants. Um, but it, it's comfortable being around her. Uh, because there's not some weird thing we had done in the past and like trying to pretend it didn't happen or whatever. Uh, plus, I was raised in, you know, the little soapbox side for a second. I was raised in a world where marriage didn't work. <laughs> Everybody I knew, my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, most of my friends. I had two friends whose parents stayed married. And not that they fought or anything, but they didn't look especially happy together. They would sit down and watch TV, never say a word to each other. And so I grew up telling myself I'm never going to get married. Uh, and I fervently meant that, uh, in large part, cause I didn't want to raise kids the way I was raised. And I, I got no boohoo story. I had a great upbringing, but I didn't want kids raised in that kind of a, you know, you know, a, a system. And, and, you know, so I, you know, go ahead and do this and, and then find out. Uh, but when I did finally decide to get married to me, it was, th- this is going to fail in spite of me. It's not going to be cause I'm not screwing around on the road or grabbing a rat here or there. Uh, I w- I, and I can look my boys in the eye today and put my hand on a Bible and swear on everything I believe it to be holy, uh, that I never cheated on their mother, would have never cheated on their mother. Uh, now, again, I feel a little bit foolish in hindsight, you know, because let's face it, Franny wasn't bad on the eyes, uh, but both Tori and Franny and all three of us, every bit of that, I swear on my kids, was a, was completely professional and there's times and I feel stupid saying that, but uh, I'm so glad it is because like, I see Tori rarely. And when we do, it's, it's always great. Uh, Freddie and I see, we, we talk to each other 20 times a week on the phone, uh, either by text or, or straight uh, by voice. Uh, and I'm glad for that because it, it's not weird or odd at all. It's just a, just hanging out with buds, you know, and uh, uh, I, I count her as a good friend. I count Tori as a good friend, although I don't see her very often. And I'm glad that we that we took that approach to it uh, because it it would make it sort of weird today. I think. What makes a good valet and what makes a bad valet? Uh, to me, a, a bad valet. Uh, there are a lot of things that would go into that. Uh, taking too much of the spotlight. Well, that's what uh, I'm actually. That's a... exactly what I was going to get at. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to cut you off on the yeah. story there, but I mean, you know, Francine, Tory, beautiful women. I mean, mm-hmm. even with them doing nothing. But, you know, they're dressed yeah. scantily to catch the eye, of course, of the most yeah. male audience. Mm-hmm. How does they? How do they not take the spotlight away from you a bit, but then other valets might? Uh, because there's a time to come to life and there's a time to acquiesce. Mm-hmm. Uh, both of them picked it up incredibly quickly, uh, thank God. Uh, when we need a breather, when we do all this, blah, 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 grab a hold, okay, now, boom, take, take the attention away. Franny also then gave to me that counterbalance, like, you excuse me and, and later tory where you you wanted to like him because they're so good looking and and beautiful but they like this guy and they're helping this guy and you know so it was really easy for them to once they got past a certain point and with the triple threat uh which i include for any and there's four of us uh there you, you know we get this panoply of reaction i would get booed uh chris would get Sort of, uh, like, sort of like they liked them. Bammer would get the golf clap, the respect thing, and Franny get ooh. So we had these 
four different reactions, you know, and I knew we had to get that sort of more in a singular vein as opposed to this all over the place. Cause then it's going to be a pop when bam, bam goes in. It's going to be, you know, the, the respect thing when Candido goes in, it's going to be the woo la la when Franny pops her stuff and it's going to be boo when I get in there. We needed to standardize that. And with Tori later, that would be, we had the same, same issue. Cause again, beautiful woman, uh, great body, very, very athletic. Um, where they wanted to hate me and love her. And so we started her hitting the line, don't hate me because I'm this beautiful. Like when you look at the lady next to you, don't, don't, don't hate us because I'm that much better looking. And that started getting the, the b- b- unfortunately we weren't given the same kind of time that Franny and I had to, to, to flesh that out. Uh, but th- you know, there is a way for you as the worker to keep that in control. So when we would go to the ring, if you recall like with Francine and Tori, be the ropes open, give them the center walk, right? So they're the star for that, that, that outset, you know, do the kiss, the chest beat. She's got the center lane. Uh, so she's in spotlight for, for a moment. Then I would come in, we would gravitate together. Then once the match started, she'd get out and she knew very quickly our trips to and from the buildings would be constantly talking about either things she did last time on the way to the building or things she did tonight on the way back from the building. She would ask the perfectly right questions. If you would have thrown me in with any world champion when I was less than a year in the business, uh, I would have probably crapped my pants and uh, probably would have really lost it up. Uh, But she really took it quickly. And where I knew Francine had finally captured that character, embodied it, was we did the entrance the one time I hold the ropes, the kiss, the chest beat. She goes in. Now, typically when I would come in, she would just sort of circle back and come with me back into the corner. On this particular night, completely unbeknownst to me, we do the rope, the kiss, the chest beat. She takes the center walk. In I come. And instead of following me, she goes the opposite direction. Where the hell is she going? And uh, she does this really sexy walk along the ropes and gets in the corner opposite me and looks at me drops her head like this sexy glance, drops down onto all fours and like a cat, crawls across the ring and comes up and kisses the belt. I went, nothing else I can teach you. You got it. (laughs) (laughs) I'd never thought of that. And, uh, you know, it was perfect. And she, both of them, both her and Tori were very willing students. Uh, They would ask the right questions. When you'd give them something, you didn't have to go back and reiterate it. They would, would execute it. Uh, and both were so easy to work with because of that professionalism. And, uh, you know, like I said, I look back and somebody had to work with those two beautiful women. And so I took one for the team. It was uh, <laughs> tough, tough to do. <laughs> uh, I interrupted you a few minutes ago when you were about to tell a story. Was it the, was that the one that I interrupted you over or was it something else? Uh, no, I think I, I was just going to say like, you know, for, uh, I think at that time you interrupted, I was going to make the point that, You know, when the two wrestlers are in the ring and they're exerting all of this to to put this spot on or this uh, this part of the match together, that's when they have to sort of become more invisible. So Mm -hmm. less movement, less whatever. Now we grab a hold, start the bang, you know, the baby face starts making that comeback. Now Francine starts coming in and she, you know, again, because we had so much more time together where she would come on franchise and, and, and would give that look and everybody in that building that hated my guts. And why are you? cheering for this jerk off. Uh, and then like when we needed like a real attention, get her boom, let her pop up, do whatever. And then Franny was always good. Something Tori did less of, uh, but what Franny was always so good for, she's, you know, she's built like a stick, right? I mean, she's beautifully em- em- embodied, but you know, a hundred pounds soaking wet power bombs through tables, bam, or pressing them over his head and throwing her. Uh, th- there was always going to be that one thing that would just let the fans go, oh, you deserve that bitch because you like that jerk off, right? And so it was just another, just ex- like an easy explosion in the match that you could get. And the fact that she was such a willing participant, and and again, bumps like that ain't easy. Uh, you know, power bomb off the top of that table. Ah. <laughs> again, golf clap, because I, I, that's a stiff, stiff bump. And Franny never complained. When she broke her hip, she didn't complain. She said, my hip bothering me, but she'd, oh, poor me, my my hip. And and she just fits so perfectly into that dressing room. That's why whenever I say the boys, I mean everybody in that dressing room. They're all the boys, right? Because they're all putting on. 
Next question. This is an interesting one. I do not know if you'll have an answer for it. Hopefully you will. Salvatore M says, Shane, do you recall an episode of Hardcore TV where it was you literally doing an hour-long promo? Good, you're nodding already, so that's good. I remember that Simply the Best was playing in the background, and at the end we find out that this whole promo was for a match against Marty Jannetty. I swear this episode exists, and I'm not a victim of the Mandela effect. (laughs) So I know nothing of this, so what happened? Totally Mandela effect. Never happened. <laughs> no, it's uh, we had gotten to the we would go to the studio, which was our director Ron Buffon's parents' house, and he had you know the the, the studio set up and all the equipment and everything. We would typically record in the basement, and you know, bless his parents, they'd be up there watching TV or making dinner or drinking coffee or whatever. And there we are playing wrestler in their house, right? And especially with this mouth, um. Uh, but we went, I I got up there to the studio and uh, Paul said, what's the longest promo you can do? I don't know, two minutes, three to five, what do you need, five minutes? He goes, uh, um, uh, I don't know, maybe seven minutes, why? I go, it's, can you do an hour? I went, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I can do an hour. <laughs> it's uh, And what happened was he had used all the, we would do that every three weeks through the ECW arena. And we would get four, five, six hours. Those were epic shows. And uh, unfortunately, he had gotten everything off that show that he that he could use or wanted to use. And we were a week short. We were two weeks out of the arena. So we needed filler. And the only thing he could think to do was do a promo. I'm thinking, Paul, this is going to this is gonna be awful. I mean, you can't do it. And he said, I said, I don't think I can do an hour talking, you know, which would be at that time, 46 minutes, I think, or 48 minutes. Uh, I, I don't think I can do that, Paul. I mean, it's how do you keep a promo going that long and keep it interesting? And he said, if we break it up into three pieces, we'll have Joey off camera ask you three questions. Can you do that? So, well, let's give it a try. So we sat down and what you don't see is Joey is literally a foot and a half to my left. And uh, if I remember correctly, I'm not looking in camera. I'm like looking off camera. And uh, he asked me the questions. And the first one, and it was pretty much as, you know, like we're doing here. Just answer the question as, as verbosely as you can possibly answer it. Uh, I think we ended up going like at 90 minutes. Uh, but that gave him stuff that he could cut and, and edit around. Uh, and people often ask about that. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised he said, probably don't, you said probably won't remember it. Uh, I remember it well because, you know, an hour promo ain't easy to do. Mm. Uh, but doing it that way with Joey, and again, Joey, I, I, everybody knows my affinity for Joey and my respect for Joey. Uh, he made it easy. Uh, just, you know, him sitting there asking the question. It was more like you and I are doing, just having a conversation on stuff. And we recorded it. And now I'm dreading it airing, you know, because of things like this. And if you're going to say, shut this guy up, God. And uh, I I don't consider that a promo. I, I consider it more like a, a pre-podcast before podcasting because it was pretty much what we do here. Ask a question. I would answer that as, as, as deeply as I could answer it and throw in the stories and stuff with it. I get a lot more accolade than that than I think I should. Uh, it was easy for me because the, the, the information's all there in my head. It's experience. Uh, the experiences that I had lived. And so Joey would pitch it to me, not necessarily asking about a particular uh, uh, experience. Say, hey, tell me the story about fill in the blank. Uh, he would say, okay, boom. And he'd pose it as a question. And he might just throw a little bit of like, 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 like Bruno. Like he'd say, okay, ask the question. Da, 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 da. Yeah, you know, like Bruno San Martino did or so just like that little quip. Like, well, okay, that put my brain in the vein. And it really was easy for me. I, not at all hard because it was pretty much what we do on a week, you know, once a month uh, 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 taping. It, it, again, Joey, I give credit to, and I give credit Paul, uh, credit to Paul in the way that he edited. It, it, it comes off like I'm just, you know, seamlessly doing this thing. And that was more the magic of television than what was the reality. So uh, easy for me. And uh, I think much more credit should go to Joey Styles for that. Because he just him sitting there, like again, we have such a friendship and a, and a respect for each other that him sitting there made it a lot more comfortable for me. Um, if I'd have just been sitting there by myself and Paul read the question and I had to answer it back to the camera, it would have been, I think, a lot more difficult. Uh, just reading this, so eventually it's revealed that you're sort of directing it all to Marty Ginetti of all people. Why Marty? 
Uh, that was, they had Marty coming in. Uh, Paul, what Paul would do is he would have like people like Marty, uh, Tolly, uh, Cody Michaels, people that had some experience in the business or name value in the business and bring them in. And this was sort of like the tryout. Uh, if they can get through this and have this kind of a match and elevate the main event, then we can use them someplace else. And unfortunately, I, I don't know if it was a commentary on my performances. Uh, you know, Cody Michaels and I went to college together. So we've been friends for the better part of 40 plus years. And I, I tell people all the time, if you want to go back and look at what kind of stroke the franchise did not have in ECW, uh, name a person that I got a job for in ECW. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of any. Uh, Sabu weekly was bringing people in to get hired for a little bit. And sometimes some stuck around, some didn't. Uh, Taz would bring people in from his school. Uh, you know, there were, Tommy would bring somebody in. Uh, I can't think of a single person that I got a job in in uh, in ECW. And uh, I think it speaks more like the, the fact that I think Paul and I had such a great working relationship is truly because we were opposites, complete opposites. Uh, his politics are different than mine. His worldview is different from mine. He grew up in a well-to-do family. I grew up in a lower class, middle lower class family. Uh, so our, our life's experiences are almost completely opposite from each other, but he saw something in me and I had a value placed in him and trusting him, uh, that we could put all that stuff aside and create this character that was the franchise. Uh, but the truth be known, there were times that as the character went on, when I would go to Paul, uh, for for example, after the Arn came and pitched the idea of Flair coming, um, and then he settled with WCW and re-signed, it was evident to everybody in the building that Flair was not coming to ECW. And I said, it looks silly, me talking about him now. Give me something else. I need to, to go a different direction. He said, no, no, I want you to keep doing that. Um I think in large part because he didn't like Rick either. Mm -hmm. And he probably got his jollies off the fact that I was, you know, hammering him so hard. But, uh, you know, I, I would beg him for things, you know, please. There were times during that run where that character started growing stale to me. I was like, I felt like I was just repeating the same stuff and that didn't hold any lure to me. And so like, I would go to him and he'd say, well, let me think about it. And then he'd never get back to me and I'd push it. And I'm, okay. But well, let me, I'm still, you know, I don't know. Do whatever you want. That, that was like sort of the way the conversations would go. And, you know, as much as I didn't like that, I think in the long run that did offer fresh approach to the, to the character because out of anger, you know, just being pissed that I come, I'm asking my boss for help with this and he's not giving it to me. It's like, okay, I'll show you how I'll, I'll add these parameters to this character. And so it made it much more intimate to me and, uh, uh, intimate in the sense that because I was creating it in my head, I understood it. I understood what this character would do with this. Like you hear me in an interview saying, I know the franchise would vote. I know what kind of women he would pursue. I know how he'd, uh, what kind of liquor he would order at the, uh, at the bar. Um, very different things. Roy Martins, uh, because I fleshed this guy out, I've played in this guy's head long enough to know how he thinks. And I say that vicariously because it is a different person. It's not when I go back and watch my, my sons asked me one time, they said, dad, do that voice you do when you're wrestling. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, you know, the, the, when you're the franchise the, <clears throat> and I sat there in my living room and I could not for the life of me find that voice. It sounded like me imitating somebody being the franchise, mm -hmm. not being the franchise. And I realized after that, I had to, I had to be in the gear. I had to be in the building. I had to be in the mindset of playing that character so that I could find that proper voice to that character. And I know to the fans, that sounds ridiculous. Uh, but you know, if, if you know, I'm, I, I was going to embarrass myself. I'll even try to the friend, cut the fucking music. It's it, there's a, there's a, a closeness to it, but there's not the verve, uh, you know, Moose will say like certain words that I'll say as the franchise will go, man, nobody says that word like the franchise. Uh, because there's so much guttural mm -hmm. into it. This is that character. It's puking out the, his dislike for the politics of the business and, and espousing his point. Um, 
So, you know, when you hear of character development, there's a lot more that goes into it. If you're going to create a character to say, okay, well, let's put a cowboy hat on him and he'll ride a horse to the ring and, and we'll put spurs on his boots. Okay. That'll be pretty cool. Okay. Then what? Like that's the visual. Then what, what is the character? Um, you know, and I think a lot of times our business has the, especially lately, uh, let's drop down to, okay, we're going to make him the snidely he, 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 it's why, like I was, and again, for me, it's my personal taste, never a big fan of Memphis wrestling, this part of it, ha, 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 I'm going to break you in half. It's like, it's like sort of the Diana Ross and Supremes yeah. stop in the name of love. It's like, we're going to pantomime this and it looks corny to me. Uh, to me, again, the, that guy that'll sneak up on you, reach down your, steal your tonsils out of your throat uh, and trip your mother and take her purse while he's doing it and then tell you why he did it. And you go, yeah, okay, I still hate the guy, but I think I get it. Um, to me, that's a, a much, more, much more nefarious heel and a much more dangerous human being, somebody that can convince you that why they're doing what they're doing, as much as you disagree with it, can make sense in your head. I'm really disappointed you said that you don't like wrestlers pointing to their brain because in the notes for the clash of the champions that we're going to be doing next week, I've specifically written on like uh, 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 Joe Laurinaitis' brother, Mark, and he points to his brain or the other guy points to his brain. I was like so happy. He points to his brain, I'm very happy. <laughs> There's not yeah. enough brain pointing in my... It, 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 maybe it's hanging out with Dutch too much, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, also, with a word that you say is the franchise, that is a very franchise word, I've never heard of anyone say, with so much passion in their voice, the word because. Uh, especially with the um, <laughs> NWA throwing down the title thing, because I can't even in, say, because! And then it's like, whoa, yeah. you really <laughs> meant that word. Yeah. yeah, it all comes from the gut. It's, you know, and, you know, I had taken some acting courses right out of college. Not for wrestling. It was just something I was interested in. <clears throat> and, you know, they, uh, plus when I uh, was first doing, uh, like becoming a star in wrestling, like moving up the card, one of my professors at Bethany, a guy by the name of uh, Dr. David Judy, <clears throat> he has since passed. Uh, he ran the theater department. And I went down there for a weekend because, <clears throat> again, everybody thinks, well, how hard's acting? He's get on camera and you do this and you do that, right? And he says to me, like, he's sitting in the audience. It's me and him in the theater. I'm on the stage by my head. Just walk across the room. Just walk across the stage. So it's no, 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 no. Walk across the stage. No, no, no. I, just walk across the stage. I'm what the hell? <laughs> I'm walking across the stage, right? He said, you look like Frankenstein's monster walking. And he, you know, got up and he showed me, like, how to, you know, like, fluidly walk across the stage what looks like a natural gait. And, uh, you know, and from that point forward, I was always like looking deeper into the things. When I'd watch my playback, I was like, oh, that's why. Because the guys like him, these classes that I took, completely unrelated to wrestling, had nothing to do with wrestling. It had more to do with an interest in acting. And, uh, uh, you know, he just, like I, I say, Steamboat opened the horizon. He made wrestling from black and white to color to me. David, Judy, and those classes that I would take after college showed me that. <clears throat> Whether you're on screen as a wrestler or, you know, just a character in a movie or a television show, there's a way to do this that uh, I, I was just watching a thing last night on, on Scripps Television with uh, uh, Jesse from, from uh, I forget the actor's name, uh, from uh, Breaking Bad. Um, Aaron, Aaron Paul. Aaron, uh, Aaron Paul, yes. A great actor. And watching him and listening to him, I'm thinking about like, what he's saying. It's like me listening to Steamboat and watching in the night sky what he's saying. I, I, I'm i hip to everything he's saying in a completely different genre. Uh, and, and I think a lot of that helped me eventually when, I, when this character of the franchise would come up because I did have these experiences and I did have these professors telling me these things and these teachers and these other classes that I would take, you know, showing you that there's a different approach to this. And and a different way to do it, and and defining the character in that skin, you know. And I, like I said, there's a to me Shane Douglas in the franchise, Troy Martin in the franchise are two very different people, and by design. And uh, I I hope the people that know, excuse me, the real Troy Martin would go, yeah, he's right. There's nothing like the, the same. And there's probably a few who say, yeah, he's just like him. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, it's uh it's been fun to play that character, and I think that there's a something in that. And in, to get back to the original question and, and Tori's portrayal 
and Francine's portrayal that they're playing something that's very opposite of them. If, if for the, the guys out there that know either of them, uh, no, like the, the characters they played with me on camera was very, very, very different than who the real people are behind that. Thank again, thank God. Uh, but you know, it's it, it's fun. Like when you get to do the stuff that we do and get on camera and and play that kind of a character, uh, it's liberating in ways and it's exhausting in other ways. But it's fun. All of it's fun. Uh, we've got time for either one or two more questions. We'll see how we go. Uh, Big Daddy Beef Boy has said, how much of today's product do you feel is failing because of the abandonment of kayfabe and the rise of podcasts? How can a product that relies so much on suspension of disbelief expect to do well when the product is immediately surrounded by detailed information of why it isn't real? Yeah. I, again, I don't think there's a place for the why it isn't real. Uh, I don't walk into a movie and go, I know that none of this is real. I know Michael Myers doesn't really exist. Or I know Darth Vader doesn't really exist. Uh, for the viewer, rather than trying to constantly figure it out or think that you're staying one step of a step ahead, maybe approach from the same point. I'm watching this like a movie. Um, and I know this guy is, this actor is playing that role and that actor is playing that role. And approach it from that point of view. I don't think, like I said earlier, you don't need to beat people over the head with it's fake or it's real. Present it. And if you present it in, in a way that the, I think where the problem of the breaking of the kayfabe comes is not so much in podcasts because you know, there's a million and one stories that get told in these podcasts. I think it's more that the younger generation has decided that this is no longer important. So we don't need to worry about that. We can just move on and, and just wink, wink, pretend, uh, well, if, you know, stop and think again of Michael, you know, the actor playing Michael Myers, if every five seconds he was pulling the mask up and winking into the camera, like, <laughs> you know, playing up the camera, it would turn Halloween into a comedy instead of the unnerving, freaky movie it was the first time I watched it. Uh, allow yourself to suspend the disbelief. And I don't think that we, we need to have, uh, imagine five, ten minutes, an hour after me throwing Gary Wolf down with a halo. If you'd have turned on the computer and there's me and Gary sitting there going, hey, can you believe they bought that? Mm. Oh, look how they reacted. This is great. Uh, there To me, there is zero reason for that. And any more than I want to see the guy playing Darth Vader, like taking the mask up going, hey, don't worry. I'm not really chopping Luke Skywalker's hand off. Uh, just just present it and let it be as it is. Uh, pay oh, pay respect to that, of what you just, uh, uh, just performed. The... Uh, when you see the WrestleMania experience and you see all these pictures leading up to WrestleMania and here's Taz and here's the franchise. And there he got this big match this Sunday on, on WrestleMania. And here they are in tuxedos, having a glass of wine together or a beer together. Why? I mean, uh, the, okay. So wink, wink, we're, we're going to let y'all see the inside, the inner workings. What does that matter? Do you need to know how the engine under the hood works to be able to drive the car? No, you get in, start the car up, drive away. Same thing with wrestling. I think our business does a disservice by we collectively, uh, the talent, expose you know constantly going out of our way to expose it to the business to try to gain a fan or two or three or a hundred uh, to saying okay, well hip hip wink wink, we're in on it too. Well, no, I've just done all the sweat that I just poured, all the broken bones that I've endured, uh, all the surgeries that I've gone through. That's all for naught now. It's just like, oh, don't, it's, it's all BS. Just go with it. And I think when you see those iconic moments of like the, the halo throw down and 1,100 people literally rioting, uh, there is an eloquence there that's, you could, if you have the trained eye to look in between and see Gary's portrayal, Anthony's portrayal, Franny's portrayal, my portrayal, Paul's depiction of the entire thing. That makes that work. Uh, I I would dare say for that split second that those fans go from yikes to jumping the railing. Nobody was going, wonder, is this, you think it's a work or not? Is this real or not? They reacted. They mm -hmm. viscerally reacted. Um, the same thing in our business. And, and I am no more or less talented than anybody on AEW today uh, or on WWE today or any of the other promotions uh, present it. Stop with the wink, wink inside view. Uh, it's irrelevant. Uh, you know, again, any more than the actors in a movie, uh, 
you know, somebody writing the book that you know the, the prologue to the book is, hey, everything you're about to read is all bullshit. Don't it's a, it's all a work. This is all fake. This is just a novel, and this is what that means. Why even put that in there? You're going to take the time to sit down on that keyboard and you know type that thing up and print it out and sell it and everything else. Allow the reader to let their brain take them where they want it to go. And the same thing with the presentation of, of our sport. I, I think we we we've digressed too much. Like I said earlier, uh, we've ex- the business has been exposed enough. Uh, there's no more revolution in in exposing more. Of it. Hey, by the way, don't forget it's fake. Um, which, which is the wrong word to use. Um, it, play it. Uh, the formula uh, implemented. If the heel knows how to get heat, and that's a big if. Uh, and the baby face knows how to shine, and that's a big if. If the storyline forces the viewer to think about it, not the how many times I heard in different places, I don't think the crowd's going to understand that. Okay, you're so brilliant, you do, but the schmucks out there can't. And even the ones that can aren't going to go, ah, I'm never coming back. I don't understand what the hell they're doing in the ring. Why are they doing that? No, everybody in that room is going to go, oh, whoa. And afterwards, let their brain turn, let that sands of time flicker through. And the whole time, they're going to be thinking about what they just saw. And at the end, they're going to form an opinion. I hate the son of a bitch. I love the guy or girl. I can't wait to come back or I'm never coming back again. Those are all visceral reactions. And go more for that. That's what acting is. I hate to let everybody break every other secret. But, you know, uh, you know, when you're watching uh, uh, Brian Cranston, you know, execute 15 people with that high powered machine gun in the final episode. Uh, nobody sitting at home going, thank God, this is all fake. I did. I love Brian Craig. I don't want to murder anybody. Just watch it, enjoy it and take it as presented. And, uh, and I think that does require at some points for us as the talent to lay off a bit. And does it matter that I'm getting online and saying, Hey, don't worry. Gary's fine. Uh, it's all pretend. Uh, or just let it sit, let it breathe, let them and let their brain take it where it's going to, to take it. It's like the old horror movies, right? When you saw Dracula back in the day, they weren't allowed to show the blood and guts. They weren't even allowed to show in the earliest Dracula. They weren't even allowed to show the two bloody fang marks on the neck. So you'd see him opening his jaw close tight in on Dracula's face. Then a close up of her neck getting closer and closer back to his face. Then the shadow on the wall and you hear a bit of a muffle. Meanwhile, your brain's going, what the fuck's happening? And your brain's filling in all those blanks as opposed to <laughs> rip it out, squirt blood, squirting every place. Uh, one's comical and one makes you go, Oof, my skin's crawling. Ask which one is which. Uh, and I think in our business, the same thing, we could do a lot better job. Uh, not that we're trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes or, just trying to, oh, damn it, but take it as we give it to you. It's not that. Present it. Present it believably. If you believe it, they're going to try to believe it. And instead of this, okay, let me get online now and just tell them exactly what happened so nobody hates me. I don't want to lose a T-shirt sale. Uh, present it and let it sit as it is. Yeah, that's the old Hitchcock theory of the mind can conjure up more horror than anything you can ever put on screen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Uh, I we will. Yeah. One more question. Just one. Got it. Yes, sir. Donny, what is the match you are most proud of and had the most fun participating in? Oh, lordy. I I think just on surface, the off the cuff remark would be uh, the match in Pittsburgh, where. Uh, as I said earlier about the franchise, there would have been a great baby face run at the end. I think the Pittsburgh pay-per-view, the November to remember 97 gave a glimpse into that. I wasn't wrestling any different than I would have in any match prior to that against any baby face. Uh, th- that character was still the same. The difference was those 5,000 fans had watched this kid <clears throat> break into wrestling, go to UWF, earn his first title, go to the NWA, you know, each they they built they were building blocks in my career. Those fans had all watched me. Many of them, friends and family and neighbors and uh, uh, residents of the same area, and came there. And then they, this was the the capital, the capitalization of all that. Like this is going to be the payoff to all that. The, the, all those years those fans had put into watching this guy, 
uh, now gets to go there. And in the inverse universe, the, the, the guy that is despised in ECW is suddenly loved here in Pittsburgh, respected here in Pittsburgh, but he's getting the snot kicked out of him. When you see, and again, I give credit all to Bammer in this. When you see Bammer take that final belly to belly through the through the chairs and things, and the the, the crowd still doesn't pop. The part of them pop, but it's on the three count when the crowd erupts, uh, because that was the the payoff of like that point, 13, 14, 15 years of watching this snot nosed kid grow up in the business. Uh, so proud of that. Proud that we delivered. Uh, both for the pay-per-view and for the hometown. But I, I think if you ask me my best match, uh, meaning where I was most comfortable in my skin, because uh, I would obsess over this stuff, uh, I had a match with Just Incredible uh, not long before I left. And, uh, and, and PJ worked his butt off. And we had a great match in the ECW arena. Uh, and he's showing, for me, he's exposing sides of the franchise character that I'd never seen, that the fans had never seen. Me pressing him and throwing him into the the upside down railing and, and you know, things like that you'd never seen the franchise do before. Uh, it was a completely inverted view of the franchise. Uh, not in his hometown, in this town where he was so despised. And PJ going in there and just delivering the goods. <clears throat> it was clear to me that PJ was reaching out to take the ring to show that he is the next guy. He's the heel. And uh, for me in my mindset, I remember being completely at ease in that match. That match, there was nah, there was none of that, you know, nausea or you know butterflies before the match. It was like, okay, let's go out and do it. Boom, did it. Went out and had fun. Completely at ease the, the entire time in the match. And, you know, PJ really working hard. Angle would be Pitbull too. Um, he had grown so trusting of me uh, that that put me at ease. And so, like, if you you watch closely as he's pressing me over his head because he was just so freaking strong, pressed me over his head, and as he's throwing me, I'm upside down, and I yell, beat your chest, and he'd start beating his chest. Uh, it was just, as I look back at it in my memory, it was a very comfortable time for that character because he trusted me, and his trust in me made me feel comfortable working with him and allowed my it freed my brain up to think so I could think for the two of us. And, uh, and then the single match again, PJ. So, uh, and then if like favorite match, uh, as far as just like, you know, overarching type of like the, the fondest memory of, uh, is any of the matches with Terry Funk, because I learned so much from him. And like I said earlier, it was like going from, you know, this uh, baby face to learning how to really be a despisable heel. And, you know, I was so blessed that I had something like Terry Funk to work with, to learn from. And, you know, I often get the credit in ECW for being the mouthpiece, but a lot of what became the, the, the mentality of ECW came straight from Terry Funk. He was, he was the leader of that. And I got to be the mouthpiece of that. So, uh, you know, I, you know, it's all the way up to the end. It's, it's rare to hear somebody, what, 12, 13 years into a career, uh, saying, you know, <laughs> bowing down how blessed I was to work with somebody like that. Uh, and that really was Terry Funk. I mean, it was a, uh, what a learning experience. The end of my entire career had those great, great turns and those great opportunities at every turn in my, at every critical juncture of my career. On that note, a great answer as well. On that note, we're going to shut it down. Uh, if you want your questions answered for a future, ask Shane anything episode, you go to Shane Douglas questions at gmail.com. I haven't got that written down. It'd be but it after one episode and yes. i don't think we've got anything else to plug so on that note we'll see you again next tuesday shane take us out hey appreciate you being here and learning in franchise university class <laughs> dismissed <laughs>